So um, in this talk, I'll go to the other end of the spectrum. Specifically, um, my interest will be on small molecule compounds. So we define these as molecules with um, molecular weight of less than 2,000 daltons. And at the same time, I also work on smaller um, microorganisms. Okay, so that will be the topic of my, of my talk. And at the end of this talk, um, I want to show you what are the resources that we have and how are we um, expanding the use of these resources. That's it. And so for people who like to go to the ocean to scuba dive or um, snorkel, you find it peaceful. But in reality, it's a very hostile environment. There is a lot of fighting among your um, marine organisms. They're fighting for food, they're fighting for space. And in this process, um, they use your um, small molecule compounds. So if you can please speak on the video. Thank you. The first example would be your very sluggish and slow moving cone snails. So these snails, they're slow moving. And their problem is, how do they catch their food? And their food would be polypic worms, mollusk, or in this case, it would be a fish. Okay? If they're still moving, then there should be another adaptation to get them find food. And in this case, they would inject powerful sedatives, which we now call your conopeptides, paralyze the fish, and the fish just gets completely involved, it, um, um, eaten, engulfed by your constant. In the second example, for organisms which are completely sessile and at the same time they don't have any hands or feet to kick or punch another organism invading for space, they would use um, molecules okay, to fight one another. In this case, you have two different corals, they're fighting for space, and the other coral is stinging this coral, and you can see that there is now a mucus in the second um, coral, and it completely became what? So, who is the loser here? Of course, this one, because the tissue is now obviously dead. So, um, in the process, you have a lot of chemical warfare. Okay, so your organisms such as corals, your cone snails, they have molecules, they produce molecules that they use to defend their um, area and also to get their food, okay? But obviously that is not the complete story because now with your own technology, it became apparent that it's not only the big organisms who is at play. It's not only the coral or it's not only the cone snail who is producing this repertoire of um, small molecules. Next slide, please. And in fact, your macroorganisms, the big organisms in the ocean can serve as a host for um, a variety of microorganisms. So these microorganisms living in their host, such as your cone snails and also your corals and your sponges, they may have a symbiotic relationship and in the process, this microbial symbiont can contribute or help the host for um, critical functions such as, for example, your car carbohydrate degradation, nitrogen fixation, so um, specialized functions that is critical to the host Microorganism. At the same time, just like us, your micro, your host doesn't want to be invaded by microbial pathogens. The host also doesn't want to become sick, just like us. So your microbial symbionts in the tissues of your host microorganisms can also um, contribute to the inhibition of the growth of microbial pathogens that is. Um, constantly also from the environment um, exposed, where the host is also exposed, so they're continuously exposed to the pathogens, and their symbionts also produce molecules that you know inhibit these pathogens. And so we can see here that your um, microorganisms, 
They can produce your small molecule compounds as well as enzymes to help their host in performing critical functions. And these small molecule compounds and enzymes that's used in nature is the inspiration for people like me. And we want to develop, bio discover and develop bioactive compounds as well as enzymes from um, the molecules produced by the microbial symbionts. And now, with the advent of your omics technology, we have um, several methods that we can use to expand the repertoire of your um, bioactive compounds. And of course, there is still the time-tested technology of bioactive <coughs> screening. Now we have genomics to look at the, what we call your cryptic metabolites. In your microorganisms, we have the metabolomics, and of course, we want to um, express a lot more molecules and capture, again, a bigger set of chemical space. And this can be done using um, microbial and chemical dissipation. Next slide, please. So at the Marine Science Institute at the University of the Philippines, uh, we're very lucky that the field of um, marine drug discovery was headed by really very talented um, and very passionate scientists. So our national scientist, Lord, uh, Lourdes J. Cruz, established the field of um, conoptide research back in the 1970s. And again, the field of the small molecule um, drug discovery, this was continued on by um, Professor Gisela Concepcion. And now as a third generation of marine natural products chemists in MSI, um, we're expanding and also uh, using the resources that we have um, in the last um, decades. So when I was preparing this slide, I realized that, um, I guess I'm too old, number one, because I started my career with the Antibody Molecular Oncology Research Group in 2000. I was my, my first job as SRS1, and this was really the time when we have very limited resources. I remember then that there were probably 20 people for one HPLC. Okay. This was in 2000, and then at the same time, we had an NIH-funded project, the NCDDG, and the focus of this was in um, sponges for the um, anti-cancer property. And so in 2008, we had a huge, we received a huge grant, uh, Professor Concepcion received a huge grant from the DOST to significantly improve the facilities for drug discovery. And so with that, there were now HPLCs for your students, um, the NMR, and then a high-risk um, mass, mass spectrometer. And then with the pharmacy drug discovery group, there was also um, the PMS-ICBG, which is the focus us on your um, symbionts from the Philippine models. And now in 2008, this was where also the field of natural products research had a paradigm shift. So with the OPEX technology, people <coughs> in the field were much more um, appreciative that your microorganisms are the true producers of a lot of the biomedically important molecules. And so with that also, the Philippines, our group of MSI, also um, embraced this um, paradigm shift. And we're not only now looking at your macroorganisms, your invertebrates, but also the microorganisms associated with them. And at the same time, we also um, explored a lot more new bioactivities in terms of your not just cancer but also infection, okay? Um, finding new antibiotics, pain, and then malaria. And then just last month, we again um, started our 
the phase two of the DDHP project, which I'm now leading, and this will give us another um, three more years of funding for drug discovery. So the projects on the of pharmacies, PMSI CBG, DHP, and the Picari ICD MCCP project, this enabled us to expand our microbial biobank from host mollusks and also um, sponges. Okay? And so, uh, as a third generation of marine natural products chemists, in my lab, we have several goals. One is we want to um, preserve and the resources, the microbial biodiversity that we already have from the various projects. And at the same time, we also now not only have the microbial biodiversity, but we also have the compound library. As you can see on the right hand side, we have um, compound library as well as chemical libraries of extracts, which are in plate format ready for assays. So as soon as we have new assays in the pipeline, then we can just take this resource, screen them, and then with the hits, then we start the larger scale fermentation. So we also want to um, develop new um, technologies or new screening platforms. We now have the HIV reactivation assay as well as the dorsal root ganglion assay. So just to give you a workflow of um, what we do in the lab, so we start with your marine microorganisms, we culture them in broth, we identify their um, this microorganisms using 16S, and then again we have the chemical extraction uh, using the ion fractionation. We want to look at the chemistry of the extracts at an early stage, and we do this by the, the HPLC profiling, which is really, uh, it's very basic, but then it's informative. And then at the same time, we run the bioassay screening of our um, MMO extracts. And to give you an example, for example, um, here, we did the antimalarial activity screening with um, the group of children see in UCSF. And for this project, we utilized the microbial biobank from the pharmacy's uh, collection in <coughs> collaboration with Professor Gisela Concepcion. And we screened about 2,000 fractions. And the bioactive hits we defined as those extracts which only allow for 30% or less growth of plasmodium falciparum when they're treated with 5 microgram per meal of extracts. And the hit rate is just 72 out of 2,000 fractions. That's about 3.5% um, hit rate. And if you look at the bar graph, okay, a lot of the bioactive extracts are in the 100% methanol um, extracts, meaning they are relatively rather lipophilic molecules that's active in this antimalarial screen. And also, this work um, we did with the uh, DDHP project in collaboration with um, Professor Sirinan from Oxy and the rest of the DDHP team. So we still have our cancer um, screening going. So we normally test against two cancer cell lines, HCT116 and um, NCF7, which is your breast um, cancer cells. And then our proxy for normal cells would be the Chinese hamster ovary cell. And with that, we got we screen about 1,400 fractions and a hit rate of about 9%. Next slide, please. And when we look at the chemistry of the fractions, we can see that some of the fractions will have same chemistry <coughs> or different chemistry. And in this case, this cluster E for the antimalarial actives, they're always persistent and they're always there. Next slide. And so what we learned from the chemical <coughs> profiling is that some of the extracts would have the same um, bioactive compounds present. And so we want to focus on pursuing extracts 
with a different bioactive principle. Next slide. And when we look at the um, 16S taxonomic identification, we can also cluster the chemistry. And so with some of the bioactive heads, such as Pseudomonas, they, ha they have the same taxonomic identification in same chemistry. But of course, for the very, um, very important streptomyces, they may have the same identification but completely, completely different chemistry. And this is what we're very interested with. And so one of our priority microorganisms is R2A788, which we identify as streptomyces. We like this um, microorganism because it's active in your anti-cancer proliferation assay. Okay, so they inhibit the growth of your cancer cells. And then we also did um, the whole genome sequencing using my seed. And when we look at the biosynthetic gene clusters using PRISIM, uh, we saw that there are a rich um, biosynthetic gene cluster. So the different colors indicate the different types of um, biosynthetic um, enzymes in these microorganisms. So we went ahead and purified the compounds and we got this um, macrolectins and we, and aside from this, we have some new analogs with this compound, so the structure I'm not showing here, but what I want you guys to see is that with your, uh, the, they have the same core structure and the decorations here would be different. And the most active one is Icarugamycin with um, low micromolar um, IC50 against her cancer cells. And so when I presented this, showed this to my student, and then I thought to my student, how can we push the production of Icarugamycin rather than the other um, less potent analogs? Maybe we can try to do beer fermentation. And I sort of said, oh, we ferment beer? No, we ferment, we ferment with fear. So by fear fermentation, the idea is to do a mixed fermentation. Mixed fermentation, but I don't want two microorganisms growing at the same time in one class. So I take the culture supernata of the elicitor um, strain and grow my producer strain, my 78, in the presence of the molecules in the growth. So it's really working by fear. So the 78 streptomyces smells that there is a competition because the, the molecules produced by the, the other microorganism is in the culture growth. And then we monitor the changes in chemical profile and change in the biological activity. So when we did the monoculture extract profile, this was done by multiple reaction monitoring in mass spectrometry. And this is a very good technique because the noise is significantly very low. And you can see that ergomycin has a low level, capsimycin be the less active, and capsimycin is more predominant. And mm then -hmm. next one. And if you change the ratio of the producer versus elicitor growth, we can see changes. In this case, the, um, when we have more of the elicitor growth, obviously you have less of the producer, and so the levels actually go down. And then we did the one is to one, and this kind of gave us more reproducible method. So we optimized the one is to one um, producer elicitor growth, and did the time course assay. Okay, next slide. And two days after setting it up, so we did a time course assay, day two, day five, day seven, we get the um, extracts and then monitored it by mass spectrometry. You have here the amount of the compound in PPM, and then you have MC would be the monoculture, EL would be the um, elicited, and you have day two, day five, day seven. At day two, you can see that Icarugomycin, the green bar is low. When you get to day five, Icarugomycin increases significantly. 
in the elicited setup compared to your monoculture, and at day seven, the trend is about the same as your day uh, five. And so our next, next task here is one, we want to determine why is the streptomyces reacting to these molecules produced by the um, elistor. And we want to do this by transcript foam um, analysis. And also, this is a targeted um, approach. We're just looking at the ethergamycin type of molecules. And <coughs> our next goal is also to look at the global um, profile of small molecules produced by 788, does it change? And produce other um, types of molecules. Because based on the biosynthetic gene clusters, you have a lot of other molecules that can be produced by this microorganism. So with that, I hope that um, you've seen that your microorganisms, they are important sources of molecules for drug discovery. And then at the same time, your new omics techniques have helped us um, develop new techniques and new applications for these um, molecules. And at the same time, chemical diversity, there is a chance that we can increase further the chemical space that we get from these um, molecules using your solicitation method. And with that, I want to thank, the, of course, the ENRRC for the invitation. And of course, my collaborators and my mentor, Professor Gisela Concepcion, my students, uh, Kevin and Charlize, who did majority of the work, um, Professor Siringan, uh, Professor Joe Derisi from CARI, uh, and UCSF, as well as funding from Jen CARI, the University of the Philippines, my host in my home institution, the Marine Science Institute, and also the OSDBC Thank you so much for your attention.